Now speaking from the historic Marble Collegiate Church in New York City is Dr. Norman Vincent Peel. Continuing in that matter of reminiscence, I noticed uh, my friend Milton Ketchum walking down the aisle, taking up the offering, and it occurred to me that probably Milton and his wife Cecilia, as far as I know, were the only two people present here today who were with me 47 years ago. Milton was a deacon and had a vote on the new candidate. Uh, did you vote for me, Milton? <laughs> He's been voting for me ever since, good friend. I always like to point out the uh, five-year-old picture of Dr. Peel and already in his uh, positive thinking stance. And on that panel is also the uh, Methodist Church, which he served first in his career as a divinity student. Practical, everyday issues of, um, that uh, we all face in our lives. And that's as true today as it, as it was um, back then. What you are now is according to the picture you've had of yourself up to this time. If it's been a fuzzy picture, then you're in a fuzzy state. If it's been a clear, clearer picture, then you're moving according to your destiny. It's very, extremely important the picture you hold of yourself. You, you never want to hold a bad picture or a failure picture or a negative picture or a weak picture or a sick pic picture. Never. That's very dangerous. My wife and I were in Hong Kong about a month ago. And Hong Kong is the great emporium of the world. If you want to save money, never take your wife to Hong Kong. <laughs> well, my wife said she knew of a, of, of a lady who made the most beautiful dresses. And uh, she said it was in Kowloon. Well, I said, look, uh, Ruth, uh, Kowloon is a hard place to get to, and uh, it's difficult, and I don't, I don't, why don't you forget the dresses and get one when you get home? She said, what do you think I came here for? <laughs> so we went to Kowloon, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> And in the shop were a number of women all doing the same thing. And there were no seats much, so I knew it was no place for me. And I said, how long will it be? And she said, I don't know, but you come back after a while. So I went out to take a walk around Kowloon. Fascinating place. If I were to name the half dozen most fascinating cities of the world, I'd put Hong Kong right up close by the top, maybe the top. At any rate, I got to wandering in these little twisting byways and finally had difficulty in finding my way back. But all the shopkeepers would come out and implore you to come in, no matter what the shop was. And I did go into several, didn't buy a thing, not me. <laughs> Finally, I saw a sign that says, artistic tattoos. <laughs> and I saw that the shop was empty, there was nobody in there, except the, the artist, as he described himself, who put a tattoo on your chest or on your arm. So I went in. He spoke a fair English. At least it was better than my Chinese. And uh, I said, do you have many customers? Oh, he said, now and then I have quite a few. I said, what do you tattoo on people? Have you got any samples? Uh, thinking that he had a customer, he brought them all out. They were mostly pictures of pretty girls. There was the American flag that you could get tattooed on you, or the British flag, or the German flag, or the French flag. And then there were a few sayings like, I'm okay, you're okay. <laughs> you could get that on there. And there were several others. But the one that struck me was one that he had there, born to lose. And I said, that one. And he tried to take my jacket off. 
No, I said, I don't want it on myself. I am astonished, I said, that any human being would come into this shop and ask you to tattoo across his chest the words, born to loose. He says, yes, it is strange. I said, did you ever do it on anybody? Yes, he said, one time. That's why I put the sign up, because he came in here and he asked me to put on him, born to lose. Why, I said to the man, why in the world would you think he would do that? Well, this old Chinese tattoo artist is a smart fella. He said long before he asked me to put it on his chest, he had tattooed it on his mind. When Dr. Peel first came to Marble Collegiate Church in the 30s, he was a totally extemporaneous preacher. He never took a note into the pulpit with him, except occasionally a letter or a magazine article that he wanted to get all the information correct from. People would come to Mrs. Peel after the service and say, gee, Mrs. Peel, that was a great sermon. Could we possibly get a copy of that? And she'd have to tell them, no, he said it, and now it's gone. We all understand that this was before the time sound recording was common and microphones weren't even much used in churches. But Mrs. Peel got the idea of having people volunteer their time to sit in the front row of the church and take stenography while Dr. Peel preached. And they would take those notes that they had made, type them up, mimeograph them, and send them out to people who requested sermons. At first, Dr. Peel told Mrs. Peel that he thought this was kind of a silly idea and not many people would really want transcripts of his sermons, but they moved into the church basement and began, to, began the ministry, which they called at that time the Sermon Publication Committee. When they reached about 70,000, they stopped putting out the uh, the sermons as single sheets and began to bind them as three individual booklets every month and mail them out in an envelope. And when they reached about 100,000, the church politely came to Mrs. Peel and told her that her sermon publication committee was taking over the entire church, could she possibly find another place to put it? At that time, she moved it up here to Pauling, New York, and it was in several locations here, over top of the Peel's garage, even in their dining room, and down over the prescription shop in Pauling a small drugstore downtown. In 1952, they finally bought the property that's located here on Route 22 in Pauling and built a small building. Um, Guidepost was a fledgling organization um, and using a, a home, a house on uh, Quaker Hill in Pauling where we had a farm, a farmhouse. And tragically, a fire started in that house and burned to the ground, taking with it all the records of the, this, new, this new organization. Guidepost lost the entire business, including the most important thing that a magazine can have, the entire subscriber list. Um, it was a tragedy because so much was lost. But through our neighbor and friend, um, the legendary Lowell Thomas, who had a daily radio broadcast, he went on the air and told about the loss at Guidepost. And miracle of miracles, in a very, very short time, the subscription list was even bigger than it had been before the fire. And we always were grateful to Lowell for, um, for making that happen. We still mail to over 400,000 people around the world every day, every month. So you can see Mrs. Peel had a good business head in looking at uh, what she was going to do with Dr. Peel's sermons. Peel Center is also the outreach division of Guideposts, and we make sure that Guidepost literature reaches people all around the world, uh, in prisons and in nursing homes, in the military, in hospitals. As well, uh, we have a prayer ministry here that prays for tens of thousands of prayer requests every month, uh, each one individually and by name. Also, Peel Center programs are the Positive Thinkers Club and the Bible Club, both Bible studies based on Dr. Peel's philosophy of positive thinking. I'm sitting at the desk of Dr. Norman Vincent Peel in the Peel Center in Pauling, New York. And this is where he and Mrs. Peel 
began the foundation for Christian living that grew out of the publication of his sermons that he delivered each week at Marble Collegiate Church. And he would come up to the country during the week from the church and he would handle correspondence here. He would work on book manuscripts, um, radio broadcast projects, um, counsel with people, um, handle the business of guideposts and the Peel Center. He was involved in so many, many different things. Um, also a newspaper column that was syndicated. He just had a vast ministry of touching people all around the world. Well, enough of that. Let's get on with the business. Which is that you, you really can have a wonderful future. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to have trouble, pain, sorrow, difficulty. You'll have that. And perhaps that isn't all bad either, because the only way you make a strong person is by subjecting him or her to difficulty and uh, resistance, painful though it may be. He was such an incredible man and, and such a tremendous carrier of, of the message of positive thinking. Uh, he was uh, himself an example of it, and he embodied it, and he expressed um, what positive thinking can do for you in a way that no one else ever has. When I heard Dr. Peel speak, whether it was from the podium or the pulpit, I was convinced that I could live a better life if I just did what he said he did for himself. Marble Collegiate Church had been a great church in New York City. In fact, when it was built in the early 1800s, the consistory of the church was roundly criticized for building such a great church so far out into the country. But during the years, uh, Manhattan moved way up north of 29th Street, and the uh, residential area around the church disappeared, and it became all businesses. And at the time Dr. Peel came there at the height of the Depression, the church had shrunk from being a congregation of about 900 down to about 225 and was more than half empty every Sunday morning. The decision of Dr. Peel to come and take the church at Marble Collegiate Church was uh, an, an interesting one. At the time, he was serving University Methodist Church in Syracuse, New York, and he was invited to come and speak at Marble and shortly afterwards, the consistory of the church invited him to be the minister there. They issued a call for him to be the minister there. At the same time, the Bishop of California had offered him what was then the largest Protestant church in the United States, the Hollywood Methodist Church. And um, he was having a hard time making a decision about which church to, which offer to accept. Uh, I think that as a, a human being, his desire was to go to the West Coast it was a Methodist church. It was a larger church than he was currently in. Dr. Peel had an awful time trying to make the decision between the two churches. And uh, he, would, he went back and forth for weeks until finally one day Mrs. Peel said, Norman, we're going to lock ourselves in the parlor, get down on our knees and pray until we get an answer. He wanted to do what he felt God wanted him to do. And Mother, who was uh, very much of a realist and a pragmatist and a great prayer, said, we're going to pray about this. And, and so he finally said to her, I believe that God wants me to go to New York. He tried everything he could to help build the congregation of the church, including at one time he had a plywood platform built out on the corner of Fifth Avenue and 29th Street. And he would go out and preach to the lunchtime crowds accompanied by a trumpeter. I came with Dr. Peel in uh, 1971, about 35 years ago, and uh, I can remember standing on lines like the ones pictured on the panel here. Dr. Peel started out life uh, before he became a minister as a newspaper reporter, said that once you got printer's ink on your hand, you never get it off, and he was right. He founded two publishing companies, the Peel Center and Guideposts in his lifetime, and wrote 47 books. He's the presidents of, uh, of this country. He could go to the White House and at any time and did. Uh, he was a, a, a wonderful friend to uh, Richard Nixon at a time when he, when he needed him. He was a friend of uh, Ronald Reagan and, uh, and his wife. 
I think because they, they, they trusted him, uh, he was not judgmental to them, he would listen to them, uh, he would help where he, uh, where he could, and uh, uh, they enjoyed uh, his presence and his, uh, his counsel. Uh, he would, they would call, or if, if they would call, uh, he had a remarkable ability to capsulize a, a situation and to put it into a, a, a sentence. And, and he could offer advice in such a way that nobody was offended. And people would remember the, that advice that he gave them at a particular important time in their lives. They would remember that advice for the rest of their lives. And we used as a centerpiece for this exhibit the Medal of Freedom, which is the highest award that a civilian can earn in the United States. This is the medal uh, that was presented to Dr. Peel by his friend uh, Ronald Reagan in 1984 at a luncheon at the White House. And I met Dr. Peel uh, not too long after I started working at Guideposts, and this is when we were up on, uh, our offices were up on Third Avenue. And uh, Dr. Peel came into the office that day uh, to give a speech at a um, organization called the Dutch Treat Club, which was sort of a, a, a group of uh, influential media type um, thinkers and personalities that would get together in a uh, top room at Sardi's restaurant and they, and they, you know, bring some guests and they have a featured speaker and have lunch and generally have a good time. Uh, so that day Dr. Peel came in and um, I noticed, that, you know, he wasn't, the, he must have been by then in his late 80s and um, I was introduced to him and I said hello and I was, and, and I asked him to sign a, a copy of the Power of Positive Thinking for me and he he, uh, he seemed to be having maybe not the greatest day. Um, he was moving slowly and he seemed somewhat distracted. He seemed very tired. And I knew that he had this, this speaking engagement uh, that noon over at Sardi's. I had been invited to go along, because so this would be my first you know, live exposure to Dr. Peel speaking. And you know, I thought, this is not right. This is a poor old man, and he really should be retired by now. And here are these people, my boss, the editor-in-chief of Guideposts. Dr. Peel, of course, was one of the most sought-after public speakers and motivational speakers of his day. He traveled an average of 150,000 air miles every year on speaking engagements, most of them outside the church. Dr. Peel felt enormously called to speak to the business community about God. He had attended a, a business luncheon in Lower Manhattan early in his ministry and had asked around the table at his table mate's religious experience. Most of them said, well, my wife goes to church or I go to church on Christmas and Easter, and that was about it. Dr. Peel walked home that day from Lower Manhattan to his apartment, which is about five miles, and the entire way he prayed about what he could do for these business people who were not experiencing God. And he, was, he got the impression that he was being called to speak to business people specifically about God. The next day, he joined the Speakers Bureau and went on the road as a platform speaker, a motivational speaker. Never left God out of his talks and was always received everywhere he went very well. So we went to, the, went to Sardis and we sat and we had lunch. Uh, and Isaac Asimov, the great science, um, <coughs> the, the great science writer in uh, science fiction, author uh, got up and, and introduced Dr. Peel and uh, introduced him as, as one of the most influential people of the 20th century, which I thought, you know, coming, I mean, I was a fan of Dr. Peel's, but coming from Isaac Asimov, I thought, what an amazing tribute to Dr. Peel. But I thought that these people are going to be a little disappointed because Dr. Peel doesn't look like he's really in the mood to talk to anyone today. Well, as they applauded and Dr. Peel rose from his seat across the table from me and made his way to the podium, you could see the, his posture become more erect and his stride become more certain. And when he got up to that podium, the entire room went silent. He started his speech by saying, I have good news for you today. And he went on to talk about positive thinking. And as he spoke, not a single person in that room attention straight from what he said. And that include, included the busboys, which I thought was the most interesting thing. Anyone who's gone to a banquet in New York City knows nothing stops the busboys from clearing tables and making as much noise as necessary to clear a table. Even they stopped what they were doing, utterly transfixed by Dr. Peel, as he became this incredibly magnetic and powerful and dynamic speaker right before my eyes. And it really was, I think, some of the best. He must have spoken for no more than half an hour, but it was one of the most amazing half hours of public speaking that I've ever witnessed.
through Christ who gives me the strength. Now, when you go out of this church today, even right now, the future begins when? When I stopped talking, it was the past. It's now the future. You see? The next minute is the future. Your glorious, wonderful future is now. The next minute, the next minute, today, tonight, tomorrow. Hold the thought. Hold the picture in mind. And it, if firmly held, will develop in fact.